Masculinity, manhood, manliness. It's been uh, traditionally defined as a set of attributes, behaviors, and roles that are associated with men and with boys. Now in the postmodern view, which is the preeminent view these days in the world around us, masculinity is largely considered to be a social construct. In other words, the, the masculinity concept, they say, is the result of the influence of culture, uh, the, the people around you, the, the, the home you were raised in. And because it is a construct of social culture, then it's obviously subject to change. But a lot of others point out that there is a problem with seeing masculinity as purely a social construct, and that there is a considerable amount of scientific evidence that will suggest that so many behaviors are actually biologically influenced. A person's DNA will typically determine their natural hormone production, and those hormones, and in the case of men, testosterone, will, will certainly affect attributes and behaviors. You, you can tell the difference between a two-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy on the playground many times just by their aggression. Uh, th those differences are often at the, the chromosomal level, and that means that men and women really are different in every cell of their bodies. It's very true that our culturally accepted standards of masculinity or manliness vary from culture to culture and frankly from century to century. But the biology of masculinity still winds up producing a more aggressive, physically stronger male uh, of the two genders, regardless of how they dress or whatever the codes of social conduct there are. Now, there's no shortage of opinions. There's no shortage of writers or speakers or commentators on the subject of masculinity today. But one thing virtually every person agrees upon, masculinity is in crisis. Even those who seek to, to break away from the uh, traditional roles would agree, masculinity is in a crisis. But for our purposes, let's admit that in this course, what we're seeking is not the postmodern view of masculinity, or frankly, any other worldview, but we're rather seeking a biblical view of masculinity. The view of masculinity as designed by a creator and as seen in scripture. Now, God has given us the amazing gift of the scriptures, and so it's to them we'll look for a very brief biblical history of masculinity. So, of course, we have to start where it all begins, in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, right there in that very first passage of scripture, we see something really important you don't want to miss. God created both masculinity and femininity. Both of them reflect God's design, but they're not the same thing. Both men and women equally reflect God's image, but they each do it uniquely. In fact, in the next chapter, in Genesis 2, verse 18, it says, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. And, you know, it's easy to look at that word helper and come up with the idea like, Oh, well, God made the little woman to just come alongside the man and serve him. And indeed, there have been entire theological systems historically that have been constructed that marginalized and patronized women. But the two little Hebrew words there that form the expression helper, uh, Ezer Konegdo in, in Hebrew, better translates this way. I made a corresponding strength or an essential counterpart. See, God's design for man and woman are two distinct designs that are equally essential and completely strengthening of each other. So it's important to realize, first of all, that God defines masculinity. And the beginning of that understanding has got to come from God's Word. Genesis 1.26 also says something pretty remarkable. It says that man is made in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, that's been interpreted a lot of different ways over time. One thing is certain. There are certain characteristics of man that are reflective of God's own characteristics. 
creativity, authority, the ability to love, the ability to speak, the ability to, to express, the ability to build, to create, more characteristics than we can actually cover that may be part of that image of God. And frankly, exploring what that means should be the pursuit of the lifetime of any man of faith. But in a practical sense, in Genesis 1 and 2, we discover that man was designed for certain things. First of all, man was created to have fellowship with God. He walked in the cool of the day. We see in the book of Genesis, he was God's friend. He was made in his image. He was made a reflection of God. And God especially loved man and wanted to have a relationship with him. God also created the man to be fruitful and multiply. It was not not enough that man was. He was to produce more of his own kind. He was to raise up others, offspring, that in fact would be pleasing to God. He also, we see, created man to rule over the earth and all that is in it. Now that's, that's loaded, it has lots of implications, but God did give man authority in the earth. Um, if God brought an animal to man and man gave it a name, that animal was called by that name. So it's very clear that, that there was, the earth was given, as the scripture says, to the sons of man. Man was to have authority. So let me just say it this way. Biblical masculinity involves authority. But of course, man messed up and he destroyed God's perfect design. Remember, God said that on the day that they ate the fruit, that they would in fact die. And he really wasn't exaggerating because in so many ways, man died during the fall. When they ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, their entire perspective changed. We don't understand what all that means. We don't understand all the practicalities. But what we do know is that the way their minds worked changed. Who they were changed. And within just a few minutes, we see the fruit of this. We see the outcome of this. First of all, the, the scripture reveals that their gaze turned inward. You see, they suddenly noticed themselves they realized they were naked. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if you think of the fact that Adam had never noticed he was naked before, that means he was remarkably self-unaware, right? Uh, 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 he had not been looking at himself. Instead, he had been looking to God and to God's garden. Man suddenly became self-aware and self-centered. Interestingly, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the center of the garden. And in a real sense, Fallen humanity has been self-centered ever since. I also think it's significant that man suddenly felt inadequate. He felt naked and uncovered, and he immediately felt insecure about that, and he began to cover up. He, he, he examined himself, and he did not like what he saw, so he started trying to cover himself up with leaves. If you think about it, he wanted to change the reflection of the image of what he saw. Man didn't like himself, and he became consumed with himself and meeting his own needs. And if you think about it, in a sense, man has become fundamentally selfish. He's self-centered. Man also became afraid. Oh, they'd never been afraid before. The scripture says that he heard the sound of God walking in the garden, and he, and he hid himself, and God called, where are you? And he said these words. The man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Man became fearful. Today, every man deals with fears. Any psychologist will tell you that the major motivating factor in any personality style is fears. We all have motivators and demotivators, right? And those have a lot to do with the things that we, we fear. And understanding fear and responding in righteous ways becomes a huge part of what defines masculinity. For example, courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is what you do in the face of your fear or in response to your fear. Uh, courage acting and dealing with and responding in the face of your fear is undoubtedly one of the most admired trait that gets associated with masculinity, right? The third thing that we see in the fall that immediately began to happen is man began to blame and he began to accuse. He found somebody else to blame. It was this woman, Lord, that you gave me. Uh, she, she's the one who caused me to eat the fruit. He refused to take responsibility. And frankly, not taking responsibility or authority and owning 
is a common trait of fallen mankind and not operating in the way that God intended. And you might have noticed that our current postmodern culture, we've raised it to an art form. We, we, we do tend to be often a society of victims. In a real sense, it's just important to understand that fallen manhood seeks to blame someone else and avoid responsibility. Genesis goes on to reveal that all of creation became cursed as man yielded his authority to Satan and sorrows and troubles and hardships came into the earth. Uh, life became hard. The earth yielded thorns. The work of man became much more difficult, much more meaningless. Um, creation began to, to groan as everything changed, as death entered into the world. And this is the story of, of Scripture. And as a result, maybe worst of all, man's eyes were opened. Suddenly, he had a fallen perspective of good and evil. His perspective of what was right and wrong and good and evil was something that previously he only had in God, but now he had an independent sense of what was right and wrong. That, that self-rooted concept of good and evil. Not revealed by God's Spirit, but rooted in that fallen nature. Now, I would be amiss if I didn't stop and just say, okay, this was the problem with fallen man, and to understand the history of masculinity, we got to understand where we came from. But let's remember also that Romans 5.12 says that just as sin entered into the world by one man, and death through sin, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So if you are a Christian, and you, you, then you know that, that, that Christ has brought life back to man. And ultimately, the world is still in the middle of that process of redemption. redemption. And God's ultimately going to bring everything about to a new design. And we presently live in that fallen world. But we're looking for a day of ultimate redemption. And meanwhile, through Christ, we again have fellowship with God. And through faith and embracing God's Word, we can also be restored to God's concept of masculinity. In those first few pages of Scripture, we see a few characteristics of biblical masculinity as God defined it. First of all, man was called to serve. Man was designed for meaningful service. In Genesis, God created this earth. He formed a garden. He made that garden a very ordered habitat, but then He put the man in it. He said, work it and keep it. In other words, I've given you a basic design, I've, uh, and I've made you a creative creature. I've endowed you with creativity. Take this design and run with it. Make it amazing. Make it meaningful. You might say that God called the man in whatever situation he found himself in to leave that situation better, bring order where there is disorder, bring improvement, make things purposeful, take everything and every person in life you touch and make it better. That's a core concept of, of biblical masculinity. The second thing that I see in that passage when he told him to work it and keep it, he, he, in Genesis 2.15, man was called to provide. The Lord God put the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The word work there is the Hebrew word uh, all bad. It means to cultivate, to, to, to shape, to manage something in a way that it reproduces and brings forth life. The work of a man produces something that provides. Um, whether that's the farmer uh, who produces crops that ultimately feed a family or feed others, or today a man who works hard at a job or his business that provides income for his family's need. Man ultimately, biblically, was called to be a cultivator who provided, who took disorder and made it orderly. Uh, you might say that a man takes every opportunity and works hard to cultivate that opportunity in such a way that it bears fruit and brings sustenance to life. God always designed man to have meaningful work, even before the fall, even before sin made that work harder and often frustrating. God still designed man to work and be a provider. The other thing that we see in that little passage is He, uh, he called man to protect. He said, work it and keep that garden. And that, that interesting Hebrew word, keep, is the Hebrew word shamar, and it means to defend, 
to guard against. In some ways, it means like to, to, to build a surrounding wall or hedge of protection. So man didn't just cultivate and serve and provide. Man was also designed to protect. All of these are masculine concepts that we see in the Genesis account. After the creation account in Genesis, we continue to see man's struggle for purpose and identity. Instead of bringing order and cultivating and providing and protecting, mankind often devolved into chaos. Genesis covers a period of about 2,500 years of human history from that very first man, Adam, and it ends with the story of a prime minister of Egypt named Joseph. And uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis deal with all the early history of humanity and all humanity. Uh, during those first few generations that followed uh, the story of Noah and the flood, the center of human civilization was in the Fertile Crescent, that area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, uh, it's modern day rock. And here, was born a man who would be a world changer. His name was Abraham. And much of the world holds Abraham as a great father figure, a great masculine man of faith. And Abraham really did change the world. Uh, from the 12th chapter of Genesis through the rest of the Old Testament, the scripture concerns itself almost exclusively with the family of this man named Abraham. He is a key person in God's dealings with man. The Bible tells us that Abraham believed in the one true God. He's living among idol-worshiping, polytheistic people there in Ur, and Abraham discovered true faith. And God eventually spoke to Abraham and told him to leave the place of his birth and travel to a place that God would show him. And Abraham believed that, that heavenly voice and that impression, and he obeyed even though he didn't have all the answers. He acted. And the Bible says it this way, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham loved God, and he trusted God. At God's word, he traveled along the Fertile Crescent from Ur to Haran, and eventually to a place called the land of Canaan. And God greatly responded to Abraham's faith, and he made some amazing promises to Abraham. He said this in Genesis 12, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I'll curse, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. God extended this special relationship with Abraham that was going to extend to the descendants. They would experience blessings, um, and they would know God in special ways. Ultimately, through Abraham's family, the entire world would be blessed. And indeed, it was Abraham's family that became the nation of Israel, and to them was born the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's important to notice that Abraham, as a man, he, he, he took what God gave him and he cultivated it and he, and he produced wealth. He cultivated flocks and herds. He provided for his family. He protected them. We read of occasions where he went to battle to defend his family and he led his home by faith. Now that was unusual in his day. Abraham wasn't just special because he was religious. And I, I'm sure there were other worshipers on planet Earth at that point of the one true God. But Abraham was also chosen for another reason I want you to notice. And not many people notice this little scripture. It's in, it's in Genesis 18, 19. It's the Lord, uh, it's some angels who are having a conversation amongst themselves just before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they say this, the Lord says, for I have chosen him, referring to Abraham, I have chosen him knowing that he will equip his children and household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Now, what a remarkable thought. One of the reasons God chose the man we call father of faith was that he would prepare others. He would look past his own needs and prepare the next generation. He just wouldn't live for himself. He would live for the sake of others. You see, Abraham looked beyond his day, and he lived sacrificially. The idea of, of the, the man as a provider, a, culter, a cultivator, a, a shelter, and a servant was found in Abraham. And is also, frankly, all throughout the Scripture. In fact, we, we see it in the New Testament. Think of the writings of Paul we often talk about when it comes to the subject of marriage. When In Ephesians 5, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Uh, 
Christ's sacrifice and his service becomes the ultimate example of God's concept of masculinity. Now, today's session is just meant as an introduction. Time does not really permit me to talk about all of the many, many men that are profiled in Scripture, but there is no better foundation to understand God's plan for man than the pages of the Bible. God in His wisdom and His mercy didn't just give us instructional Scripture. He didn't just give us the epistles to the churches. He gave us the historical narratives of Scripture as well. These uh, bios, these profiles, and these lives, these narratives of Scripture were given to us so we could learn because they are an accurate telling of man's journey. The things you deal with in life have been dealt with by a man before you, by many men before you. And Paul pointed to these characters in Scripture that we read about in the pages of the Old Testament, and he said these words in 1 Corinthians 10. These things happen to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, upon whom the fulfillment of the ages have come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall, because there's no temptation that sees you except what is common to man. What you're going through, somebody else has suffered, and the feelings that you struggle with, even if you think you're the only one, you're not. They've been lived by someone before you. In fact, they're lived by many men around you. The problems we face have their roots in actual events experienced by actual men and women recorded all throughout the pages of Scripture. So we want to look at those as a lifestyle. The lives of men and women in Scripture, their good deeds and their evil deeds, are essential to understand if we want to get a full understanding of what it means in God's eyes to be masculine. And yet, never has the masculine ideal been more confusing to so many. Styles change, culture change, but, but God's design really has not. If you think about it, for most of human existence, survival itself kept man's role pretty clear. Man had to farm. He had to defend. Uh, survival dictated it. Survival dictated that, that he work. Survival dictated, I mean, if, if uh, uh, choices were simple for men throughout history. If you were a farmer, the chances are your father was a farmer, his father was a farmer, his father before him, your son knew he was going to be a farmer. Those choices were, were simple, and survival itself dictated that. Maybe if you came from a family that made shoes, your father was going to be a shoe, was a shoemaker, and your great-grandson was going to be a shoemaker. That was how people lived. And until the 20th century, if you think about it, most men never traveled more than 100 miles from their home in their entire lifetime. You travel more today, probably in the course of this very day, than your great-great-great-great-grandfather probably traveled in his lifetime. That's just a fact. You see, today, the world has changed. People tend to be congregated more in cities. Um, we live lives driven by technology. The food arrives miraculously in the grocery store. Uh, most people don't have to worry about fighting off marauding bandits. So the, the concepts of masculinity that just kind of naturally happened by the force of life in years past, well, it's changed a little bit today. But who you are hasn't changed. And God's design for you hasn't changed. And every man is still a servant. He's a cultivator. He's a provider. He's a protector. Men are called to leave the world better than we found it. That's how God made you. And I hope this class will begin to help equip you to do that.